Well, good morning. Hey, it's been a good day. Good day. Hope you're having a good day. It's beautiful outside. Uh, and before you pinch me, I do have green on. I, I didn't realize I did have green on because uh, earlier people like, you didn't wear green. I'm like, I know, my bad, sorry. Not really, but whatever. Um, and then I realized, wait a minute, I do have green on my watch face. So step back, all right? Leave me alone. Um, anyway, we're glad you're here. My name is Chris, uh, one of the pastors here at Crossroads, and it is my great privilege to open up God's Word with you. So want to make sure you have your Bibles open. Leave it open there to Acts chapter 1. If you do not have a Bible, we would love to give you one. Ushers will come. Just raise your hand up. Ushers will come find you. They'll hand you a Bible. And if you don't own a Bible, that is our gift to you. Please keep it. Take it with you. Uh, read it. Enjoy it. If you do have a Bible, you can just leave it in the seat there, and we'll, we'll take it from there. So thank you for engaging. In, with the scriptures this morning. Again, we are going to be in Acts chapter 1. That passage that was just read will be our home base for the morning. I want to remind you as well, if you have any questions that kind of come up from today's message, maybe it's one of the main points, maybe it's just one of the scriptures I reference or something, um, I want to encourage you, text in your question. We've been making videos through the series and trying to do our best to answer those questions. Uh, there's no way in a sermon you could answer all the questions or chase down every rabbit trail. My sermons are long enough, so like we don't need to do that. So we're uh, all trying to help outside of that by answering some of the questions you might have. Feel free to text to that number and we'll make a video this week trying to answer those. Now, for those of you who are newer, for the last three weeks, we've been asking two basic questions in this series. First question is, what is the church? And the other question, what is the church supposed to do? So those are our two big questions. What is the church? And then what is the church supposed to do? Those questions, those are questions about identity and mission. What's the identity of the church? What's the mission of the church? And then why, why is that so important? We've been trying to hit this. Like, why is it so important to know those? Well, because identity determines action, right? Identity determines action. And, and that's true for people, for individuals. That's true for companies. That's true for governments. That's true for schools, right? And it's, and it's also true for churches, it's essential for every local church to understand what God intends his church to be so his church can know what he intends his church to do. Once you know who you are, now you know what to do. And fortunately, God is incredibly clear in his word about both the identity of the church and the mission of the church. There are other things that, that are not as clear in the Bible. But the identity of the church and the mission of the church is absolutely crystal clear in his word. And so we spent the first two weeks looking at the identity of the church. And then last week we began looking at the mission of the church. Um, because again, identity determines actions. Who we are determines what we do. And if you remember from last week, we boiled the mission of the church down to two primary concepts. So down to two primary concepts, gathering and scattering. How does the church fulfill the mission that God's given us based on the identity he has given us? We gather and we scatter. Okay, last week we focused on the idea of gathering together and what we do when we gather. Today we're going to focus on scattering. What do we do? Why do we scatter? Like if we gather, what's the point of leaving? What do we do when we leave? Now let me show you how those two come together because I think in a lot of our minds we have this opinion that those are like diametrically opposed and that's not how it's supposed to be. Gathering and scattering are not supposed to uh, be opposed to each other, they're friends of each other, right? They work together, gathering and scattering, work together in God's mission of the church. So write this down if you would. One of the primary purposes for gathering as the church is to prepare us to scatter. So this is where they come together. It's in this place and smaller environments and homes and small groups and classes and all of that, all the different ways that we get together as believers, again, in large groups and small groups. Part of the reason we do that is to prepare us for the rest of our life 
as Christ's ambassadors on mission in the world. Now notice, it's not the only purpose. We gather for lots of reasons. We gather to worship and glorify God. We gather to use our spiritual gifts to serve and encourage other brothers and sisters in Christ. We gather as a public witness to the city to declare by just our physical presence together that we are followers of Jesus and he's worthy of all that we are and all that we have. We gather to be fed God's word and be built up in our faith. And on and on we could go, like for all the reasons why God designed his church to be a gathering people. But for what we're talking about today, know this, we gather for the purpose of preparing us to scatter all through the rest of the week into our homes, our neighborhoods, our city, our schools, our workplaces, recreational places, our restaurants, can I get an amen? Right, our coffee shops. Rec leagues, parents, I was over at the Little League game this week. Wow, I forgot what that was like, right? But God's calling us to be salt and light there as well, right? So we're prepared when we gather to scatter. We gather because we realize that everything we find, uh, we find ourselves, everywhere we find ourselves, God has called us to be salt and light in that place. We're his representatives. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. We are the representatives of Jesus wherever we go. And God uses the regular practice of gathering with our brothers and sisters in those large settings and small settings for the purpose of refining us and transforming us more and more into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. For his own glory and the good of all the places we find ourselves on a regular basis. Now, let me hit a couple of passages we've talked a lot about in this series, and you'll hear me for years and years talk about. First one, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 to 25. Notice it gets at the why we get together. Look what it says. And let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds. All right, so let us consider, let's think about the ways that we can encourage one another in love and good deeds, all right? Reflecting Jesus in our daily lives. Not giving up meeting together. So if you're considering how are we going to encourage one another to love and good deeds, one of the things you can't do is say, well, then I'm just not going to gather with other believers. That's not an option because that's one of the primary ways God encourages us through others to love and good deeds. As some are in the habit of doing, right? But encouraging one another to do this, to gather all the more as you see the day approaching, right? The closer we get to the return of Jesus, this is more and more necessary that we get together, encourage one another on to love and good deeds. And now again, remember that was written roughly 2,000 years ago. And so we're 2,000 years closer to the return of Christ. That means we need it, in a a sense, we need it more now than they did 2,000 years ago. And we're going to need it more and more and more again the closer we get to Christ's return. Uh, Matthew 28. Uh, We often call this the Great Commission, but it's not really, you know, a commission. (laughs) It's a command. Notice what he says. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So therefore, based on that authority, go, go and do what? Make disciples of all nations. And that word nations there is really, really important. We think of nations, we think of lines and boundaries and places in the world. That word nations actually means all ethnicities. So Christ's church is called to take the gospel and reflect the character and nature of Jesus and do love and good deeds among all people, all different ethnicities, whether they're in our community or whether we go around the world. But before we get to that, you got to understand that word go is a really, really important word as well. It's not a one-time thing. It's a continuous, ongoing action, meaning his church is never meant to stop going. Did you know that? All right, so here's what I know about Crossroads. This church has been around for a long time, longer than any of us have been alive, I think. Let me look around. Because this, this church is around 125 years old, right around there. So like, 
Yeah, I think we're, I'm safe to say that. Okay, so, so 125 years ago, a bunch of Swedish people got together. I'm Scottish, love y'all. And said, we need to start a church in Turlock, California. And here's the good news. Like, once that was planted, once that was started, the mission didn't end. It wasn't like, go plant a church in Turlock, now you're done. The people of God, the church of God, is to be a, an ongoing people of God. We are to be a missional people of God. We are to continue to gather together, to make disciples, to encourage one another, to build one another up for the purpose of going. And that never stops until Jesus returns. So since that's true, that we are a going church, that we are a going people, before I send you back out on the mission field, here are three, three things you need to know before you go. Okay? Three things you need to know before you go. First one, we are to continue Jesus' work. What do we do when we go? What do we do when we leave this place? Well, we continue the work of Christ. Now, look at back Acts chapter 1. Hopefully, you're there in your Bible. If you aren't sure where that is, table of contents is your friend. Go there. No, no shame. It's all right. Acts chapter 1, starting verse 1. Notice what Luke says. He says, in my former book, Theophilus. Now, that's exactly how Luke started his gospel. So, the gospel of Luke starts out the exact same way. Theophilus was probably some kind of influential, wealthy benefactor who paid Luke to do research on the whole Jesus thing, right? So that's how you get a gospel. Luke went and interviewed tons of the original disciples and other eyewitnesses of the resurrection and eyewitnesses of Jesus' ministry. He put together the gospel of Luke. Now, this is meant to be the continuation of that story. It doesn't end with Jesus resurrecting and ascending to heaven. There's still more. Jesus is still going to keep working. He's just not doing the work on earth himself. Now, he's working through his church. Now, look at this. It's amazing. I wrote about all that Jesus, what's the next word? Began. In that former work, that gospel called the gospel of Luke, I told you all about what Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. Now, we're going to get to seeing him taken up to heaven right here in Acts chapter 1. So, it's talking about everything that happened all the way up to basically chapter one of Acts. But here's what you need to know. There's actually 28 chapters of Acts. So what does that mean? The work kept going. And I used to be a part of a church planting network called Acts 29. What's that supposed to mean? Well, it's not biblical. There's not chapter 29 in Acts. It's metaphoric. All right, it's supposed to be saying, and the work continues. Why? Because we're going. We're a going people. And the work that Jesus did was the beginning of his work. And it didn't stop when he ascended back to the Father. This is one of the reasons Jesus ascended back to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. His plan all along was to do what only he could do. Live the life of perfect obedience for us to die in our place for our sins, to rise from the dead victorious over Satan and sin and death, and then to ascend back to heaven to rule and reign at the right hand of the Father over all of his creation. In other words, we don't continue his work of atonement. So when we say we're the, the role of the church is to continue on Jesus' work, our work is not to do the work of atonement, right? We can't continue that on. That's something only Jesus could do. We are the recipients of that work. All right, so we receive his atoning work through faith, by his grace. However, we have been given the task of living out the realities of his teachings and his way of life. Sharing those with as many people as we possibly can until we see Jesus face to face. And through our work as apprentices or disciples of Jesus, God will continue to, to do the work of Jesus in the lives of others. And this was God's plan from the very beginning. Notice this passage on the screen. I want you to see, I'm not making this up. Look at this, John. 
14, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, very close to his, his arrest. Look what it says. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me, notice that, whoever, this is every follower of Christ, every Christian, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. What? Whoever, not just some special class of Christians, not just the apostles, nope. Whoever will do the work, or, or whoever believes in me, will do the works I've been doing. And then it gets crazier. Notice what he says, and they will do even greater things. They're going to do my works, and then they're going to do even greater things than these. Why? How is that possible? Because I am going to the Father. So there's something that has to happen in order for us to do these greater works. The son has to go back to the father and you'll see why that is in a minute. Now, how is that possible? How are we going to do greater works? We are talking about Jesus, right? How are we going to do greater works than Jesus? Well, first, we'll see that the only way that is possible is through an ongoing relationship with him. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, not just working with us, but actually within us, okay? And also you need to know, greater doesn't mean greater in quality, okay? There, there's no way the quality of what we do is going to be greater than the quality of what Jesus does. In other words, how many of you have turned water into wine here recently? Anybody? Water? Now, I know some of you work at Gallo, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Don't give me that mess. You know what I mean. You know what I mean, by the way. All right. So like instantly turn a bunch of water into wine. None of you. How many of you have ever walked on water lately in the middle of a storm? No, yeah, don't even try. Right? No. Anybody cured anybody of leprosy lately? No. Anybody raised anybody from the dead? Didn't think so. All right. So, so here the greater is not talking about quality of works, right? It means greater in quantity means there's going to be more works done than just in the life and ministry of Jesus. Jesus was one person, an amazing person, no doubt, the God man, of course, but still in his humanity, in his limiting of himself for 33 years, he was one person in one place at one time in history. But he will have many followers, at this point, probably billions who will continue on in the power of the Holy Spirit and spread uh, the gospel and spread out all over the world for an unknown amount of time doing his works. So more will get done. They're going to be sharing his teachings, living out the reality of his ways. And when God chooses, doing miraculous things. All for the purpose of bearing witness to the goodness, mercy, salvation found through placing one's faith in Jesus Christ. So, Jesus began his work by coming to earth, living, dying, and rising for us. Now, at this stage of his plan, he is doing his work through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it all flows from an ongoing, vital relationship with him. Okay. And maybe this is why we individually are not experiencing those greater works. You hear John 14 and go, well, that must be nice. But what you have to understand is those greater works flow out of an intimate, real, ongoing relationship with the risen Christ. Let's get, look at what Jesus said in John chapter 15. To his disciples, he says, remain in me, remain in me. Some translations will say abide in me. It's relational language. language. It's referring to intimacy, like being closely connected to, be closely connected, be in a real relation, be an intimate relation, be abiding in me as I also remain in you. Just like no branch can bear fruit by itself, right? A branch isn't going to like... Bear fruit unless it's connected to a vine or a tree. It can't. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit. Neither, neither can there be spiritual fruit in you unless what? 
you remain in me. Unless you are in close connection with me, in close relationship with me. And Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If, see the condition? If you remain in me, if you stay in relationship with me, and I in you, look what he says, you will, it's a guarantee, you will bear fruit. Here's what we know about Jesus, here's what we know about Jesus, is he's a healthy vine, would you not agree? We all know that if a branch is connected to an unhealthy vine, it may not produce fruit. But here, we're talking about Jesus. So we know there's nothing wrong with the vine. If there's any problems, it's the branches. Can we not all agree? Like, so if you're sitting here going, well, it's Jesus' fault that I'm not, you know. Hold on. The vine has no problem. It's often the branches and the connection with the branch to the vine. So he says, if you remain in me and I knew you will bear much fruit. You'll do those greater works promised. And, and if, you know, I'm going to trust him. He's the one who predicted his death and said he'd rise from the dead three days later. And he did it. He pulled it off. I'm going to trust him. And he said, this will happen because apart from me, you can do nothing. No spiritual fruit apart from me, Jesus is saying. Apart from a relationship with me, apart from remaining in me. And then goes on to verse 8. This is to my Father's glory. Hey, man, just, just so you know, this isn't about you. Church is for you, but it's not about you. Church is for me, it's not about me. Just because I have a stage and a light and a microphone, this is not about me. The church does not exist f- to give us a platform to, you know, get the spotlight. That's not what this is about. This is to my Father's glory. It's for the glory of God that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves. It could be translated proving yourselves to be my disciples. Why is this one of those proofs or evidences of discipleship? Well, because the disciples are the branch. And if a branch is connected to the vine, there's going to be fruit. And if there's zero spiritual fruit in our lives, what makes us think we're branches? One, let alone connected to the vine. You see, the overflow of our relationship with Jesus is that we will continue the work of Jesus. That's the overflow. If the branch is just connected to the vine, there will be fruit. It's the overflow. Our calling is not to hide away in our private Christian bubble, but rather to be in an ongoing vital relationship with Jesus, equipped by being an active participant in the local body of Christ, the church, and sent out into the world, scattered as the salt and the light of the world because that's who you are according to Jesus. For the purpose of continuing his work in the world, for the glory of God and the good of the world, just like Jesus. Jesus in the same context as John 15, a little later on John 17 says, just as the Father sent me, I am sending you. Just like the Father sent me, I am now sending you. So as you're sent back out this week, know that your calling is to continue the work of Jesus wherever you find yourself this week. You are his representatives. Let that identity shape how you live your life this week. Now, something else we need to know before we head out into our mission field. Number two, we are dependent on the Holy Spirit. Write that down. We are dependent on the Holy Spirit. Now, here's what I know in a room like this. Um, Some of us here, we are dependent on the Holy Spirit and start instantly asking, are we going to be a charismatic church? Are there going to be people like, you know, with tambourines and rolling down the aisles and like, you know, waving flags? Is that where we're going to be? And And if that's how you associate charismatic church or associate the work of the Holy Spirit, you need to broaden your categories. Why do we always go there, by the way, in our minds? All right, this, this is not technically a charismatic church. But what you need to know is that apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, we are sunk. 
We are done. Nothing of eternal significance is going to happen in this place unless the Holy Spirit is at work in us and through us. Do you believe that? And it's sad that we equate it to all these outward external things that sometimes are true and sometimes aren't. If we hope to accomplish anything that matters for eternity, we've got to have the Holy Spirit at work. There is no way possible to continue Jesus's work in our daily lives apart from this. We simply do not have the power. We do not have the ability. We do not even have the desire. Do you realize you wouldn't even want to do Christ's work if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit inside of you, changing you from the inside out? That desire is not even there apart from the Holy Spirit. We don't have the understanding to be able to continue the work with, uh, without the spirit that Jesus sent living and working in us would be impossible. Again, back to John chapter 15, last part of verse five, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. How are we intimately connected to Christ? Through his spirit that he sent. This is how we're in relationship with the son. This is why Jesus said, it is so much better that I go back to the father because now I'm just with you, but I'm going to send the spirit and he's going to not just be with you. He's going to be in you. And through that have close connection to me. We're like a car without gasoline or electricity. If you're cool. All right. So, right. You know, and it could be a beautiful car. It could be a slick car. I mean, it could be like the latest, greatest thing and look beautiful, but without gas or electricity, it's not going anywhere. And same thing's true with us. We could have this beautiful building. I love that stained glass. We, we could have great music, and we do, thank God. And, you know, whoever is up here who's, pr- who's teaching could be the most convincing person. Well, amazing, awesome, great, cool. Weren't we all encouraged? Who cares if the spirit's not in it? Nothing's going to happen. We might get motivated for a few seconds and then we walk out the door and we're like cussing out our spouse on the way home. Like if the spirit's not at work, if the spirit's not working, who cares? And Jesus is saying, nothing's going to get done apart from that. Again, back to Acts chapter one. Look at this. It's so blatant. It's so obvious. Look at this, Acts 1, starting verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command do not leave Jerusalem, which is awesome, right? Like he's, our, I love, he's almost like he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth. Because at the end of Matthew, you get the Great Commission go into all the world, make disciples, but wait. Right? It's like being at Disney hurry up and get to the line, and then you're going to wait. Right? This is what it's like. like go, 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 get there, and then you wait for two hours to ride a 30-second ride. That was awesome, right? Go, 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 make disciples, but wait. Now here's, why is it so important that we wait? Keep going. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. What is he talking about? Which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You will be placed into the flow, the work of the Holy Spirit. He will be in you. You're placed into Christ. It's like baptism. Verse 8. But you will receive power. Why do we need the Holy Spirit? Because we need power. We're like that beautiful car with no gas or electricity without the Holy Spirit. You will receive power. The Greek word under that is dunamis, the word we get dynamite from. That kind of explosive power. Not just power, but like power that can move stuff. You get power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and then, then you'll be my witnesses. Not until then. In Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There are two promises here. First one is this. Disciples or apprentices of Jesus will be empowered. Guaranteed. 
You will be empowered. You have everything you need in Christ Jesus to live a godly life. That's what God's word tells us. You have everything you need in Christ Jesus to live a godly life. Why is that? Because you have God living inside of you. You are not a God. God is living inside of you. It's California, I gotta clarify, All right? So you, I, we are not gods. We are the temple of God. God lives in us. And we will be witnesses if we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We will be empowered to do that. That's what we just read. I want you to see that. Look over in Acts chapter 2. It's really cool. Acts chapter 2, if you don't know, the promise was that the Holy Spirit would come. That's Acts 1. Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes. Day of Pentecost, all these Jews from around the known world have come to Jerusalem, all speak in these different languages because they're from different nations, even though they're Jewish. Holy Spirit comes, enables the 120 or so disciples that were there to speak different languages. That's the gift of tongues. They were able to speak the different languages of all the people who were in town so that they could hear the gospel in their own language. Can God do miraculous things? Absolutely. Is God still doing miraculous things? Absolutely, for sure. That hasn't stopped. He speaks the gospel, all these, they hear the gospel. All these people become believers. It says at the end of this, 3,000 in one day became followers of Christ. Now, notice how Peter responds because everybody's like, what in the world is going on? This is weird. What's happening? We've never seen anything like this. Notice verse 14, or uh, yeah, verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Look what he says. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. Why did he say that? Well, if you, earlier you saw, everybody thought they were drunk. It's, it's just insanity happening. It's crazy. It's confusing. How are we hearing the gospel? This doesn't make any sense. It's only nine in the morning. <laughs> He's like, most people aren't getting drunk at nine in the morning, right? So yeah, that's not what it is. No, but somebody says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Oh, so hundreds of years before, the prophet in Joel chapter 2, if you want to write that down, Joel 2, verses 28 to 32, prophesied that when the Holy Spirit comes, all these people are going to be proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. The Spirit is going to come. When the Spirit comes, all these men and women are going to be prophesying about the kingdom of God, and that's exactly what happens. So listen to the prophecy a little bit. Look at verse 17. He's quoting the prophet Joel now. In the last days, can we just stop there for a second? In the last, when did this happen roughly? about 2,000 years ago. And the prophecy was hundreds of years before that saying, when it's the last days, the Holy Spirit's gonna come. That's how you're gonna know you're in the last days. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. This thing went from Jerusalem, now it's around the world. All people are indwelt by the Holy Spirit who are in Christ. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. On and on you go. What, what he's saying is that was the fulfillment of that prophecy. That's what's going on. If we were in the last days starting 2,000 years ago, what does that mean for us today? It means we're still in the last days. Everybody calm down. Can we all just calm down? Can we stop looking for signs? All the signs have already been given. They're, they've already been given. Everybody relax. Let's stay on mission. Let's be calm. Let's remember we got a role to play. We're to be empowered witnesses in the world. And that leads us to number two. 
disciples or apprentices of Jesus will be witnesses. Why is that? Because that's your identity. That's who you are. You are a witness of Jesus. In other words, you've had an experience with Jesus. You're in relationship with Jesus. He has saved you. He's transforming you. And now we're to be witnesses of that to the world. Uh, The word witness is a very interesting word. Uh, The Greek word under that is the word martus. Can you think of a word that we might get from that? It's the word martyr. And here's what we know about the early church. One of the greatest ways the early apprentices of Jesus witnessed to Jesus was by being martyred, by being willing to die for their faith. The ancient historian Tertullian said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And the same thing is true today. Go to the places in the world where it's illegal to be a Christian. Go to the places in the world where it's illegal to have a a public church that's faithful to the Bible. And what you're going to see is it's exploding. Even in the places where you could be killed for your faith. It's exploding. The church is exploding. Why? Because the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It's one of the most powerful ways to witness to Christ. And why do they witness that way? Because it's true. They're genuine. They're the real deal. How do you know you're really a follower of Jesus? You're willing to die for it. And people are just like, wow, there's, got, there's something to this. There's something to this. So how are we witnesses? In what ways do we witness? Write this down. We are witnesses through word and deed. Witnesses through word and deed. We are given a message and we live a lifestyle. Both. And there are traditions in the Christian church that want to emphasize one over the other. Like one's more important than the other. And we're just not given that in the scriptures. We've got to hold them both in balance. Okay? So, so our witness as word is not as, you know, more important than our witness as life or deed. Because we all know our life and our deed can actually completely offset what we're saying. Correct? Okay. Uh, we, we, we've all heard the saying, the reason your neighbors don't go to church is because they already have been there. Okay. So like there, we got to understand like those two have to work together, word and deed. Uh, go to a couple passages, go to second Corinthians five to the right in your Bible, second Corinthians five. Notice what Paul, this, this is talking about word. Like we witness through a message. 2 Corinthians 5, um, starting verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, anyone who's in Christ, anyone who is a follower of Christ, the new creation has come. How so, that's so cool. Here's another way we know we're in the last days. New creation has already begun. It began the moment Jesus was raised from the dead. When's God going to recreate the world? He already started in the resurrection of Christ. And every time there's another person who's in Christ becomes a new creation, a part of that thing. What's that mean? Well, the old is gone, the new is here. And look, all this is from God. It's not from religion. It's not from your effort, your own efforts. It's not you pulling yourself up. No, it's from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, now that we're reconciled, To God, through Christ, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We've been reconciled. Now we get to help reconcile people with God. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us, look at this, the message of reconciliation. So here, how, how are we witnesses? We got a message that will, is powerful enough through the Holy Spirit to reconcile people to God if people will receive it. So therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors. What? What is an ambassador? Let me tell you who an ambassador is. It's somebody who doesn't make up the message, who doesn't edit the message. They are given a message from a superior and they deliver the message. And that's who we all are if we're in Christ. 
We're therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Think about this. Every time you share the message of Jesus with somebody, no matter how much, how long, whatever, that is God speaking through you. Do you see what an incredible privilege this is to be a witness when you speak the message of Jesus to people, God is speaking through you. And I know it's so easy to get into this American mindset. Well, the pastor is the one who speaks for God. And he's, this is true of all of us. We are ambassadors of Christ, God speaking through us. And so therefore we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's what we're calling people to, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So in him, we might become the righteousness of God. So we're witnesses through word. What an incredible privilege. We don't edit it. We don't change it. We don't take out the parts we don't like. We deliver it in love and grace. And here's the beautiful thing. The Holy Spirit takes it from there. You don't have to seal the deal. Isn't that good news? You don't have to seal the deal. You can't seal the deal. The Spirit does that. The person has to receive it and accept it. You can't make that happen. But we are responsible to be faithful. And we are responsible to not edit the message. We are responsible to speak it and share it. But that's not the only way we're witnesses. Remember? Uh, through word, but also deed. Look at this in Matthew. It'll be on the screen. Matthew 5. You are the light of the world. That's who your identity as a believer is. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden. So let your light shine before others. Live your life in front of others. This implies that we're not hiding away in our little Christian ghetto. It implies that those who are not followers of Jesus see us and actually do life with us. Amazing. That they may see your good deeds. Now notice, here's the balance. It's not just living the life. We also are, have a message to deliver. But it's not just delivering a message and then saying, see ya. It's being in relationship with people. Letting them see what Jesus is doing in you. And then when God opens up those opportunities, you already have a message. You don't have to create it. You just speak it. Here's what I believe. Here's why I believe it. And God does the rest. Let them see your good deeds that they may glorify your father who's in heaven. Let them see it. Let them see your life being transformed. So some things to know as we go, as you're scattered out in your mission field this week, we are to continue Jesus' work. We are absolutely dependent on the Holy Spirit. And then third and last, we must remain focused. We must remain focused. How many of you will agree with me that it is so easy to be distracted in the world we live in? Am I the only one? Like squirrel, what? Uh, oh, no. <laughs> like, it's just... We, we live in such a distracted world, and I don't have to tell you all the reasons why. You know why. And on top of all that, it's an election year. Talking about distracting, getting us off mission. And as Christians, we are notorious for getting distracted by things and ideas that are good to think about and are important, but in the grand scheme of things, they are less important than the mission Jesus has for us and what he's called us to be and do with the short amount of time we have in this life. And this is not a new problem. The way we're distracted, that's pretty new for this generation. But the fact that we have been distracted as Christ church is not new. And it's not simply just an American church problem. It goes all the way back to the original followers of Jesus. Look back in Acts chapter one. Did you see it earlier? Did you see the distraction? Look at Acts 1, start in verse 6. So they had just said, hey, uh, Jesus had just told them the Holy Spirit's going to come. 
I'm going to send the Spirit. Look at the very next thing, verse 6. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, why would they be asking that question right there? Because Jesus just said, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. Why would they assume, well, if the Holy Spirit is coming, then it must be the end times. It must be the end. The kingdom's new heavens, new earth. It's the end. Why would they think that? Because the Old Testament prophecies were, here's how you know it's the end times. Here's how you know the kingdom is being established on earth. The Holy Spirit's going to come. They knew their Bibles. Their problem wasn't knowing that. Their problem was not understanding, well, the kingdom's already here and it's, and it's already around us because Jesus came and God has a different timeline than we do. God's chart is different than their time chart. God has different lines and different diagrams than we do. We've, we've got a bunch of them. We make it so confusing and we get so distracted when that's not the point. Anything in the Bible that talks about end times or whatever, it's meant to, one, encourage us as believers, scare the mess out of non-believers. But for believers, we have nothing to be afraid of. And it's to encourage us to live in such a way that we know Jesus can come back any moment. And are we ready? So they asked the question, they just didn't understand how it's all going to play out, which none of us understand that perfectly. Stop it. Stop. None of us have this perfectly figured out. That's why there's tons of different views of how it all works out. This is one of those areas where the Bible isn't that clear. And here's how we know you got all these different views, but we all agree Jesus is coming back. And that's the focus. So keep going. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the father is set by his own authority. Can you imagine how many silly movies would have been made? How many conferences? How many charts? How many denominations would not have started if we would have just known what the Bible says, it's not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. Whew. But here's what you do need to know. Verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then you will be my witnesses. Put your charts away. Put your divisions away over secondary issues. Stay focused. Don't get distracted. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You are being sent out on mission with him. And listen, we should read those passages in the Bible. We should study them. God has given them to us. There is really helpful stuff there. How I view the end times massively affects how I live my life right now. 100%. I'm not saying it's not important. It's just not the main thing. Don't get distracted. And it could be anything. It could be anything that's just distracting us. Good things, but they're secondary things. Don't be distracted. So let me ask you a question. How are you doing with focus? Specifically, your focus as a follower of Jesus. How are you doing with that? Are you distracted like the disciples were? Keep going down to verse 9. Look at this. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes. He ascends to the Father, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. So imagine, which we all would be doing. Jesus is ascending. We're like, oh, it's amazing. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. These are angels. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the very same way you've seen him go into heaven. One thing there is, what's the main thing? Jesus is coming back. What's the second lesson? Get busy. 
Why are you standing here staring up in the sky? Why are you spending more time drawing another chart? Why are you starting another denomination? Why are you fighting over this? There's something to do. Go be my witnesses. And start right here in Jerusalem, he said. Start right where you are. Crossroads, start right here. Turlock. So how are you doing with your focus? One of the reasons the weekly gathering of the church is so important for followers of Jesus is because we all need help focusing. Will we all just be honest about that? We all need help focusing, myself included. We're all easily distracted. Not necessarily because we want to be distracted, but because we are constantly being pulled from all sides. And after all, we are only human. So Jesus, in his infinite wisdom and kindness, has provided a spiritual family, a body, a place where we can gather week after week and be reminded of why we are still here and who we ultimately belong to. And he's given us the weekly reminder of this fact, that God loved the world so much that he sent his son to do for us what we can never do for ourselves. He lived for us, died for us, rose from the dead for us so that we could experience his love and forgiveness. We can be in relationship with God. We can have a life that matters for eternity. And we can have that longing for our ultimate home And that reminder that we have is called the Lord's Supper. And in just a moment, we're going to receive that together as his people. Jesus said that the bread is a picture of his body, a reminder of his body. He said the wine is a reminder of his blood that was shed for us. And we are also told, Christ said, I will be with you to the very end of the age. How is he with us? Well, one of the ways he's with us is through the supper. The apostle Paul is the one who said, 1 Corinthians 11, when you eat the bread and you drink the wine, you are participating with Christ. He is present with us. He meets with us. It doesn't become Christ, but Christ is present with us. This is a sacred moment. And every time we come to the bread and we come to the wine, we're reminded again, oh man, this is about Jesus. And I'm still anticipating the coming of Christ and I've got work to do until he comes. And so in a moment, we're gonna receive together. And I wanna encourage you, before you come, the apostle Paul says we're to use this time uh, to examine ourselves. That we're to look into our own hearts and our own lives and see, is there anything that maybe, maybe different ways in my life that I'm choosing to live my way as opposed to God's way? And, and Paul says, examine that, confess that. And then when your heart's ready, come before, come and receive the bread, receive the wine. So here's how we'll do it. The first half of the room, if you would come forward, you can go to the outer aisles, come down and then go back up the middle. The second back half of the room, if you would go to the outer aisles, go back and then come back in the the middle aisles when you're ready. Again, you don't have to rush. We've got time. But when you're ready, come and receive together. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you are a good God. You know we're human. You know all all our frailties all our weaknesses, how easily distracted we are, how easy it is for us to get off of your mission, how easy it is to forget that we are a gathered church for the purpose of being scattered in this community. God, thank you that you meet us right where we are and you call us to something better. And you don't just call us to it, you empower us to do it. We praise you. We thank you for that. Now, as we respond by receiving these elements, this bread and this wine, God, would you, as you've promised to do, meet us in this moment. Commune with us, Christ. Feed us so we are better equipped to go and be your people in the world. So God, would you do that work in this moment, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together, we'll sing, and when you're ready, come on down and receive.